11 o'clock. It is 11 p.m. on Nerd News Monday here on CBS After Dark. Uh, it is 0700 GMT, and I am here. If you want to know exactly what I'm doing, actually, I am watching another one of my artificial intelligence intelligence class videos. Um, I have told you as of last week on Nerd, Nerd News Monday that I uh, am going to be proceeding with a plan to work on some of my education skills. Um, I have two or I have two bachelor's degrees, one in psychology, one in philosophy. So I'm not hurting, but I would like to develop skills toward having an app, building an app, a game of my own that maybe could make a little money. I don't know. I think it's um, something I've wanted to do for a long time. Something I feel like many people tell me I probably should have done rather than try to be a news reporter. <clears throat> but either way, uh, this is your best after dark. Nerd News Monday and a busy Nerd News Monday it is. The failure of my TV tuner gadget. We'll talk about this coming up. We will talk about the X-Files at the end of the hour. We will talk about um, the first ever meteorite fatality. A human has been killed by a rock falling from Earth. And yes, um, by a rock falling from space to Earth. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really quite something. Can I fix this a little bit? Okay. What else? Card swiper scams. A couple of people were arrested in a news story I saw about uh, a card swiper. Uh, what do they call it? A skimmer, right? The card skimmer thing. And it was at a bank ATM. I would love to see pictures. I have not seen pictures yet of the uh, swipers or the you know devices that were recovered. The suspects actually, I think in the news story, we'll talk about this, were running away from police or somehow threw the device out the window of the car before the police stopped them. But the device was still recovered, and we'll talk about that. Solar. Solar, solar, solar. I have done much solar news here on Nerd News Monday before. Um, and I have talked also specifically about what I want to talk about tonight, which is uh, legislatures and utilities that are reacting badly to the solar thing because they're trying to not, I mean, it's one thing to not want, uh, you know, your customers to be, I don't know, I feel like there's, there's, you know, I, I don't feel like people necessarily deserve to profit from it any more than utilities do, unless they're seriously generating a shitload of electricity to the point where, you know, they like deserve to be, they're practically an energy generator at that point. I don't know how the laws in this shit work, but I do know that right now people with solar panels get paid, I think in 44 states, the uh, same amount of energy that it is worth that you pay for if you use it from power company and I think that's like 10 cents a kilowatt hour something like that right um, at least it used to be and um, so you know some legislatures now uh, there's a whole interesting article actually too and we'll cover as much of it as we can tonight uh, as I said we, we, the reason we are 23 hours late doing this show is because I went to the Renaissance Festival and had a blast yesterday. And the problem was I came home, had to work, teach a couple of English classes to some students in Latin America, and then put on my virtual reality goggles, put on Star Trek the motion picture, and fell asleep within about five minutes. Um, that is an absolutely true story. On Facebook, some of my friends, the less sports inclined, and many of them there are, uh, were saying somehow, like yesterday, kind of was a day to watch Star Trek the motion picture. I thought, ooh, yeah. That does sound good, you know, and uh, and so the next thing I knew, and I have not watched it yet on my virtual reality goggles, which are right here somewhere, aren't they? What happened to my virtual reality goggles? I think they got under my blanket or something, but I don't know where they went. Here, good board. This is the best rehearsal I've ever had. Um, let's just take these off and pick these on. Now, of course, uh. Normally the phone goes right there. I guess I could put that here too and show you what it looks like. Um, of course, you can't see it function because there's no way to sort of hold the, to display what you see in each of the eyes of the goggle. But this is what it looks like on the outside. And it seems to be freaking out. There we go. 
And you look around and it's a full 360 degree environment, both left to right axis as well as the up down axis. Um, I don't know if I've shared this with you anyway. Uh, the only function that is useful at a time like this is what is called the pass-through camera. In other words, it uses the camera that is where? Here, on the uh, front of the phone, and then uh, you're able to see. Now, you don't have depth perception, really, but you are able to see pretty good, as a matter of fact. And um, the funny thing is, here are my glasses, right? Actually, uh, I don't even need to wear my glasses, and I can see. Um, and without my glasses, I'm incredibly blind. Now, the resolution's not that great. I'm told the phones now have high res, like the phone I have, has what is called 2K. In other words, double 1080p, or double what is called HD. The new TVs that are out actually are what, 4K, right? They're, they're quadruple HD in resolution. Um, these phones are not quite that advanced but I really love these goggles because when I figured out that my phone was the one that's com one of the ones that's compatible with uh, this device, I absolutely... <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> on top of that, when I figured out the price of the plastic goggles, now keep in mind, there's no technology in those goggles, right? Only The only technology is on the phone. It just manages to make a little screen here and a little screen here. And... Um, and then kind of curve it in a way that these reflective um, conca or convex lenses, convex on both sides, kind of, um, I don't know. It's remarkable and it's spectacular, and I highly recommend it. I wish I could share it with my Nerd News audience more. Um, all I can really do is talk about it, because uh, for the love of God, I wish I could somehow w line out the video to my tablet. You can actually see what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, we are going to have an intermission in the middle of tonight's two-hour special event because, uh, well, I need an intermission to have a soda and go get to go to the bathroom and so on. But on the other hand, it is Nerd News Monday now. In an hour, it'll be Game Show Tuesday. So for Game Show Tuesday, we're playing Scrabble. Found an, an, I found a friend of mine, the great Chris, the Game Show Guru, uh, actually linked me to a... YouTube account that has just a shit ton of Scrabble, and it might actually be Scrabble episodes that are not the usual ones on YouTube that come up when you hit Scrabble Game Show 1980s. Also, what do we have? Oh yeah, Pasa Palabra. It's password, but it's in Spanish. Uh, we'll have a little bit of that just to give you a taste. Um, and because the next time we do Game Show Tuesday will be after Valentine's Day, that's some Game Show Valentine's for you also, courtesy of the great guru. Um, Chris, who sent me these, and they are art, by the way, they are su supremely classic, and they're absolutely what I will be giving. In fact, it makes me want to actually print them and send them to friends, just because of how cool they are. Like, the ones I discovered last year that I gave sort of family and friends were actually um, NASA ones. I used to have them around here somewhere. I printed two sets and then only gave one set away. Um, but little things like... Um, Oh, God. What was the guy who did the Mars Lander in 2013? He had a name like Borat or something like that. Zorab or something. But um, anyway, he's a really you know, sexy dude, and he's like a real genius, and actually landed a device on the surface of Mars. And he had like a famous um, mohawk during the landing of it, is what I remember. And he's super cute, and he's super hot, and he had uh, like stars, colored stars in this mohawk on TV, and then he was all like, wait, wait, don't tell me and stuff. I think this was right before I moved to Mexico, and then I heard him interviewed on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me in Mexico when I was working there. And maybe some personal observations, too. Let's get started with the nerd news, the actual news of the nerd news um, here. We'll be pausing at 12.50, or I guess, uh, sorry, 11.50, in about 40 minutes from now for a 10-minute intermission, and then we'll come back with Game Show Tuesday, and who knows how late we'll go tonight. Um... Boy, Gate Nerd News Monday. Here is another article I saw on Facebook from uh, designing the Klingon battle cruiser from Forgotten Trek. I've seen many of these designs, of course, before the Matt Jeffrey sketches were in a number of books. I think that I have somewhere the Star Trek sketchbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, 
Since the Klingons were the enemy, I had to design a ship that would be instantly recognizable as an enemy ship, especially for a flash cut. There had to be no way it could be mistaken for our guys. It had to be threatening, even vicious, so I modeled it on a manta ray, both shape and color, and that's why it looks like it does in the original series. Even the underside of the wings are kind of painted. Um, but what I find really interesting is the early part of that, where he talks about he was worried about how it will show up on TV. He knows it's going to be it's going to go by really fast. My hair is driving me crazy here. Um, but yeah, he knew the ship was going to whip by the screen and the viewers really fast, right? And the funny thing about that is I know from the earliest... I've seen interviews with Matt Jeffries. And uh, in one of the interviews that I saw him with was talking about how he was designing the Starship Enterprise and he knew that it had to have a distinctive design that would be easily recognizable as the ship went whoosh, fast by the screen. And I thought, even the first time I saw that interview and that clip, I thought, wow, oh, what a... I mean... Of course, I guess any good production designer would think that way and consider those things, but I still feel like, man, he was a genius for thinking that way and considering those things, you know? And so reading it again when it comes to the design of the Klingon ship, that is sort of a mindfuck. Like, it really trips me out, but I really love reading it. The ship's design was perfected by a 24th century sketch. I'm sorry, it was perfected by a 24th sketch dated November 20th, 67. It was then sent to American Model Toy Corporation and they returned a mastered tooling model which we used in the show. So they went to a toy corporation for the model. The original model for the D7 was given to the Smithsonian and Matt Jeffrey says, I assume it's still there along with the Enterprise. And the funny thing about that, and there is news about that too, um, the Smithsonian folks have dismantled the Enterprise. Uh, Can I find this article? Yes, here we go. Gizmodo. This is from uh, about a month ago. And I probably should have brought it to you earlier, but again, yes, the Smithsonian is restoring the USS Enterprise model. Um, that's Maybe I saw it on Trek Corps. Um, they've been doing some scans of the actual model used. They can see actual damage, like there. Uh, the cracks in the actual, I guess, like the paint or the wooden structure. It's made of wood. Um, the museum is also doing its own work and evaluation, which has included using UV light to analyze the paint and figure out where we have clearly repainted areas and where we have areas that seem to be more uniform in their paint. The top of the saucer section leads us to believe that it is the original paint. It all fluoresces in the same way. Um, and if we click on the Trek Core link, which is the original story, and this is maybe what I saw, yeah. Um, ultraviolet photography, there's the people who are the enterprise experts that are on board with this. The, the museum is actually working on it um, with these guys, the consulting team. And it's you know, a really great uh, article. I feel like we should read it, but I don't want to spend too much time trekking out today because we have enough to talk about when it comes to Star Trek. Although this is a fascinating article. If you have a chance to go into it, uh, please do. What I was actually interested in reading more about right now on the air was designing the Klingon battle cruiser because this is an article I have not seen. Um, I actually discovered it live on the air here. So we're going to do it. Um, yeah. While referenced but not seen, the original version of the episode Trials and Tribulations, the model featured an amalgam of detail from both the original series model and the Katinga seen in the motion picture. Um, the newer model bore a pale green coloration in line with future Klingon vessels. So, yeah. Um, interesting. I remember when they did Trials and Tribulations. I was a freshman in university, uh, Arizona State University. And, yeah, the year 1996 was a great year in a number of ways, one of which was Deep Space Nine did Trials and Tribulations. And uh, Deep Space Nine is, of course, the last Star Trek series made that I like. I really can say I like it, as opposed to the other ones which I sort of tolerate. Um, the later ones, Voyager and Enterprise. 
Although people who I do respect, people, Trekkies, whose opinions I respect, say that Enterprise is good and worth revisiting. So I may do that. Yet another model, this time built entirely digitally, was used for the 2006 remastered version of numerous original episodes. Uh, Michael Okuda noted that the Klingon ship was basically in two forms. In early episodes, when it was very small on the screen, it was the original version of the ship, which had essentially no surface detail. The ship was reworked somewhat to add surface texture for the Enterprise incident, the Land of Troyes, and Day of the Dove. And of course, in the Enterprise incident, they added the Romulan bird markings. All of the upgraded motion picture version, the one I watched last night right before I fell asleep, was going to be called Katinga, built by Magic Ham. I remember seeing the Magic Ham word in uh, the closing credits of that movie. Measured six feet in length, the most significant change in design was the more detailed surface so that it looked better on the silver screen. And of course, anybody who knows those movies knows the Starship Enterprise was also impressive and uh, amazing. What was I looking at last night? It was some kind of series of photographs of the filming of Star Trek The Motion Picture of the... Um, and they were photos I'd actually never seen before uh, of the uh, docking sequence with the travel pod and the original starship in the beginning of the movie. Um, hmm. We painted it a darker color. They liked the idea of a black starship, but it would have been impractical for the movie, so they came up with a dark military green. And yeah, um, Ron painted a giant Klingon symbol on the underbelly of the ship. It was a revision of the old Klingon symbol. When Douglas Trumbull took over supervision of the special effects, Andy Probert was asked to contribute to the design of the vessel's bridge. Doug wanted something like the interior of a Japanese submarine. He wanted a bridge suspended between shock-absorbing supports with mechanical operation stations for the crewmen. As Trumbull put it, the interior of the battle cruiser should look like an enemy submarine in World War II that has been out at sea for too long. Probert's concept of what looked beneath the battlecruiser's oddly shaped bridge helped set the style, of course, for all Klingons later in Star Trek. And that's a long time. The, mo the motion of uh, the following storyboards were published before the release of the motion picture. Still relatively no, but relatively little was known about the storyline. They depict the opening sequence. I've never seen these before either. Initially, the scene would have featured the Vidya probe bursting from the blackness of space, attacking the Klingon cruisers without any apparent provocation. Later, it was decided the Klingons should be the aggressors attacking Vidya, and that is sort of true form. Um, and man, look at these storyboards. How much different would it have been? Can you imagine? Chip looks great. So yeah, um... And that's not even something that I had sort of anticipated talking about. I just sort of kind of saw that at the last second. And I'm like, yeah, we might have to throw that in there. And I might have to get another copy of Star Trek Sketchbook. I don't know where mine ever ended up. All right, it's best After Dark. It's Nerd News Monday here on the program. And the next one, the next one, the next news story we are going to watch is, or watch, God. I'm not having a very great night, but at least I'm coherent compared to last night when I was so tired, I was just dead asleep. But yes, according to thedailybeast.com, and this is in the past 24 hours, the story was posted, a falling meteorite has killed a bus driver. Read it with me. It's in India. Scientists said Monday a man who was killed on a college campus in India over the weekend died because a rock from outer space hit him. Three others were also injured. The object, a meteoroid that survived entry into the atmosphere and then fell to Earth, left a four-foot-deep crater and is the first time in modern history that a person's been killed this way. Officials say the astronomical event smashed the windows of classrooms and vehicles at Barathidasan oh Barathi Barathi Engineering College. Barathidasan Engineering College in southern India and could be heard as far as two miles away. The bus driver killed in the crash was walking close to the area when it hit. Um, yeah, I need a moment to ponder that and take a sip of Mountain Dew because holy crap. Um, read it at the Wall Street Journal. Is this actually... Okay, here it is on the Wall Street Journal. Um, no. Yeah. 
An India blog on the Wall Street Journal. Meteorite killed man at Indian College, says Chief Minister. So these are officials. This is a picture from 2009. Spray calls it an unidentified object. Uh, I'm just reading. Um, anyway, described the fragments as bluish black in color, fragments of the rock after the impact. Um, the guy who was killed, V. Kamaraj, suffered severe injuries while he was walking. He died Saturday. Three others, including two gardeners, were also injured. <sighs> um, they're calling it a meteorite didn't elaborate on what authorities led what led authorities to believe the crater was caused by a meteorite. The spokesman for this woman's office couldn't be immediately reached for comment. A meteoroid is a small particle from an asteroid or comet that goes around the sun. When a meteoroid enters the atmosphere, it burns up, usually. A meteorite is a meteoroid that survives entry into the atmosphere. Um, Associate professor at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics says there was extremely little possibility of a small meteorite falling to the ground and killing someone. Um, there is no record, according to U.S. NASA folks, there is no record in modern times of any person being killed by a meteorite. An individual's chance of being killed by a meteorite is small, but the risk increases with the size of the impacting comet or asteroid, NASA says. Um, and yeah, you remember this one. In 2013, 3,000 buildings were damaged and 1,000 people were hurt, mostly by flying glass when that famous one... Um, maybe we can actually see the video, because I think there was a video of it, wasn't there? Uh, to, oh, you have to uh, fuck it. you have to read the whole story. Uh, do you have to actually subscribe to the Wall Street Journal to get that shit? Well, we're not going to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal here tonight on CBS After Dark. The number here, 310-776-5869. That's 310-776-COONS. You can call or text even if you're watching uh, and we're not live. The time now live is 11.23 p.m. for Nerd News Monday. 0723 GMT. And then uh, at the top of the hour, we'll be doing game show Tuesday. We're doing a two-hour show since I missed the show last night due to the Renaissance Festival. I was going to show some videos from that. I never uploaded them yet to YouTube. So look for that, actually, tomorrow. Anyway, let's continue here. I have other stories I wanted to bring to you, including the really interesting thing about solar. Okay? Uh, there's actually two stories, and I don't want to do them both tonight because it's rather involved, um, but this is from Vox.com, and again, this article is about six days old, so it's not, um, it's not like it's a year old or anything like that, but let's read it, and I'm going to give credit to the author here just because I'm reading David Roberts' story. By fighting rooftop solar, utilities are setting themselves up for worse to come. This article is talking about the combination, the confluence of solar panels, which have been around for years, and these home batteries, like the one from Tesla, which have not been around long, those batteries are going to change the game again for utilities who are trying to change the game on solar as it is now. Let's just read. Large incumbent industries threatened by new upstart technologies do not always respond wisely. Shocking, I know. Um, currently, utilities are threatened by distributed rooftop solar panels. They're pushing back against rooftop solar in states across the country. It turns out, though, that by squashing or rolling back current support mechanisms, utilities are only accelerating the development of a much more serious and enduring threat. That threat is solar plus storage, what I was just saying. An integrated combination of batteries, photovoltaic panels, and electronics capable of managing the system. The system is, to quote the Mount Rocky Mountain Institute, a utility in a box. Make it big enough. It could supplant the actual utility entirely, taking the user entirely off-grid. And the other article I mentioned that we're not going to do tonight, but we are going to do maybe next week, is this one mentioned here, a separate post reviewing the value and current economics of solar plus storage. And that's obviously very important. We've talked about solar here on my very uh, nerd news and weekly cast here uh, in the past year. 
Rooftop solar reduces utility revenue. Of course, utilities don't like that, they explain. Utilities don't make money on electricity itself. They are only allowed to recover their costs. Instead, they make profit by earning a rate of return on investments in grid infrastructure. By the way, those same investments in grid infrastructure are charged to the consumer. The problem is charges for in infrastructure are typically bundled with charges for electricity on a bill. It's all lumped together into a single per kilowatt hour volumetric charge. Consumers who use more pay more. And that makes sense to me. So when rooftop solar customers buy less utility power, they're paying less for those sunk investments in infrastructure. And in order to get the same rate of return on those investments, utilities have to raise the rates on the non-solar customers. And that doesn't make them very popular. It also drives more cons customers to install solar, and that accelerates the cycle. Okay, now, I'm going to learn a new term here, net metering. It's a near ubiquitous policy, according to Vox.com. 44 states plus Washington, D.C. have it in some form. This pays customers that use solar panels the retail rate for any surplus energy they produce. In other words, if you're paying 10 cents per kilowatt hour to use energy from the power company, you will get paid 10 cents for every kilowatt hour of energy that you produce and don't use yourself. Utilities want to pay solar customers a lower rate for their surplus electricity and charge them extra separate fees to cover grid investments. And again, when we do the full on like special report on the solar, we will look not only at that other article mentioned, but this utility dive list of the top 10 battles going on right now, because that's where the really good shit is as far as this juicy story. Um, interesting though. Here, in most cases so far, utilities have lost, but in Nevada, the Public Utility Commission decided in favor of utility, cutting compensation for and increasing charges on rooftop solar customers. Also, the state of Hawaii, which I used to like. Actually, I used to like Nevada, too. Uh, Hawaii ended net metering last year as well. But I don't like in the I don't like any state where the politicians seem like they're in the pocket of the power company, or for that matter, anywhere else. But um, especially reading this makes me angry and suspicious of these goddamn politicians in Nevada and in Hawaii. But it makes me like the politicians in California, where the Public Utilities Commission decided in favor of the solar customers preserving the current payment regime. And I also don't like this sentence. I don't know if I agree with it. According to the author, these short-term battles are playing out. And however they play out, conventional wisdom is that net metering can't survive in its current form. One way or another, solar customers are going to have to pay more. Um, I don't buy into that premise necessarily 100%. Like, who says? Like, why? Like, you know, I mean, it's, it, they, he does say it, that's conventional wisdom, whatever that means. So I don't know exactly how much I buy into that that is conventional wisdom. I don't know how much I buy into that, even if it is conventional wisdom, if it is true, um, if it will turn out to be true in real life. But let's.